get back It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. (laughs) Dr. Jeremy Wise here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. And today we have Matthew Zachary, founder and CEO of Stupid Cancer, which is the largest charity addressing young adult cancer. Uh, he's also the founder of Instapeer, the first anonymous mobile matching platform for cancer patients and caregivers. He was a concert pianist uh, and when he was diagnosed with brain cancer at 21. Matt, Matthew, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Jeff. Jeremy, but that's cool. Uh, <laughs> Have you been called worse than Jeff? Yes. Okay, uh, Especially from New Yorkers. But right. um, fun fact, man, I always like to start off with a fun fact, and you were expelled from preschool. Ah, uh, yeah. Why? That old story. Um, I was a, a prodigy. I was a gifted child. Um, pros and cons, I did really well in school. Um I was also horribly misbehaved. Hmm. So gifted and how? Tell me what what uh what that looked like. I was reading and writing at the age of two. Okay. So, um, all downhill from there. But um, I was just understimulated. I didn't. There was no such thing as like gifted programs back then. They kind of invented them back in the late seventies, and I was in one of the first New York City classes for gifted children. Hmm. But. Um, you know, nursery school wasn't uh, wasn't the right thing for me. I didn't fit, um, but I wound up biting the teacher and then biting the principal because I didn't get what I wanted. And uh, goodbye. Great for your parents. So, go yeah. into I want a little bit of uh, early age. Where'd you grow up? What were the big influences for you? I grew up in. Uh, I was born in Brooklyn. I grew up on Staten Island in New York City. Um, moved back to Brooklyn after college, but my, I guess my heroes growing up were Optimus Prime. Uh, I didn't realize it, but Billy Joel was like my, and Neil Diamond were like all my parents played mm. all through the 80s, so those guys. Um, once I started playing uh, piano when I was 11, I really got into like, like Berlioz and List, like what 11 year old gets into, you know, post Baroque, pre contemporary European, I don't know, that, um, I don't know, like, like I was a child of the 80s. So, what was Back the first here? time? Yeah. Tell me about the first time you sat at the piano with your mom. Well, the first time I even knew piano existed was yeah. in fifth grade. One of these uh, students in the class. Her father was like the biggest pediatrician on Staten Island, so for her birthday we went to this like castle, <laughs> and uh, the normal whole birthday party, yeah, yeah, like a, just like my house, just like my house, and she there was this gorgeous like seven foot white grand piano in her basement, and she played it for like all the kids there, and I saw it as a source of attention, mm. first and foremost, um, and at the time I was I was playing trumpet. But when I got to middle school the next year, um, somewhere in the fall of, I don't know, maybe 86, 85, my father bought my mother a spinet piano Hmm. because she had played when she was a kid. And and basically my grandmother threw it out the day she got married. So um, my mother played. She got up there and played. I came home from school one day and they moved the furniture around. There was a piano against the wall. It's like, hey, look, attention. So I asked my mom, like, where do you put your finger? Show me how to play. Hmm. And within maybe 30 seconds, I was just playing instinctively. Wow. So sight reading, um, uh, I don't have perfect pitch, I have relative pitch, but just I just understood it immediately yeah. out of the gate. And the lessons started like the week afterwards. So that was really my, yeah, I was about 11 years old. Wow. So when you were junior high, high school, what did you want to be when you grew up? 
I wanted to write commercials. I really? wanted to be like a jingle writer. Really? Yeah, I really I just wanted to write jingles, and then I got into like film scoring, and I wound up wanting to write for Hollywood. And I took my CD collection was all Hollywood film composers, mm. jazz musicians, and classical music. I jingles, have, jingles, yeah. and classical music. Yeah, I, I didn't really have like you know what was it, Guns N' Roses, Def Leppard, Nirvana, you know uh, Slayer. I didn't listen to most of that stuff. I listened to film music in the eighties. Yeah, and um, big names, you know James Horner, um, John Williams. It's like they they pervaded my world, and that was what I uh, wanted to be. It, it's rare. That you kind of know that at such an early age, but I was yeah. that was what I wanted. Yeah. So, what's your favorite jingle of all time? Oh wow! I'm gonna have to go with McCann Erickson's "I'd Like to Buy the World a Coke." What else? Yeah. From a commercial perspective, oh, commercial, yeah. it's still a song, but um, Jello, J E L L O. <laughs> Um, and then Barry Manilow's McDonald's song, You Deserve a Break Today. Right. When you say that, it, it pops into my head. Um, Hot Pockets, I don't know, the comedian. Hot Pockets, right? yeah. Yes, it's the comedian does a whole thing on that. Yeah. Like, so, um, so, you know, with that, I was, you know, listening to your talk, like I was saying, at the New Jersey Convention, uh, Cancer Association, I think it was. Um, and so... You were playing at the time. What did you progress to when you were from an early age as far as a, a concert pianist? I was classically trained by a Juilliard graduate. Mm -hmm. She might as well have had like the slap ruler that the nuns used to use in the 50s. Very rigid, very methodical, very um, mechanical. Mm -hmm. And it was great. I needed the discipline right. and the structure. The girls didn't want to hear that, so I started to launch some pop music. My mom didn't want to hear that, so she got me jazz lessons. And then I started to play at a speakeasy on Staten Island as a high school senior. Really? Uh, for, um, let's just say, a, a special crowd every Friday and Saturday for two years. And uh, I was the lounge lizard playing Tony Bennett. Wow. You know, and, and Mala Femina and whatever. Um, so I had this really strange sort of melange of genres that right. I could play anything of and I developed this strange like hybrid way of composing, which is really weird. Um, but you know, I, I that was kind of my world was just inventing yeah. music based on all the influences that I had yeah. building up to that going to, going to undergraduate. Yeah. So when did you first notice something was going on with your body? Oh uh, yeah. About eleven with puberty, no I'm kidding. <laughs> Not that part. Um, during the summer, I went to Binghamton in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. During the summer of 95, it was right after junior year and the start of senior year. And I was home in the city and I interned uh, that summer for Dean Witter on the 68th floor of Tower 2 of the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. And it was remarkable. I, I was a really extraordinary uh, internship that summer, but I started to experience some headaches going back, and I've had migraines all my life um, from like early, like eight, nine, ten years old, yeah. and but these headaches were like in the back of my head, like around here, not really like here where yeah. most migraines are, and uh, I didn't know what it was. I just chalked it up to Static. whatever. Yeah. Yeah, got back to school and immediately started playing piano again, like 68 hours a week. Wow. And I, um, my left hand wasn't arpeggiating. and had lost a certain level of uh, dexterity. Hmm. And I noticed right away, but again, like, whatever, maybe I'm tired, I don't know. You just that explained was, it away. Yeah, that was, you're 21, you're invincible. Just right. Right away. Yeah. yeah. So that was when it kind of started that summer. Mm -hmm. So then when did you decide to actually get it checked out by someone? Uh, pretty soon. 
Really? I was at, regrettably, I was at the mercy of like a state education campus services. Right. Really, I mean, they're, I would imagine, great people, but not New York City kind of care. Yeah. And you're a college student, so the last thing they're thinking is anything serious. You're like hung over or whatever. Right. Uh, I went, I continued to go back and back and back and back to the campus services that my left hand wasn't working. I'm also a lefty, so I started to have trouble gripping a pen and writing. Mm. Um, I had a laptop, so I had trouble typing. And then, of course, the, the arpeggiations got worse and worse. I was losing uh, my fine motor skills. Yeah. And um, I couldn't even, like, snap. Like, I couldn't. It was weird. And they kept misdiagnosing me with anything but what I eventually had, which was brain cancer. But it was, like, meningitis, mini-stroke. Epstein Barr, um, carpal tunnel syndrome, um, and ischemia, and um, eventually, they did, literally, they gave me Robitussin at one point because they thought I had just a really bad flu. Mm. So all these things kept compounding over the fall of '95, and then I finally went home over Thanksgiving break, and during that time kind of everything really hit the fan. I started to slur my speech. Mm. I lost some peripheral vision. Um, I started fainting and having these vertigo um, wow. experiences. And that was when they said, you need to go see a neurologist. And I said, you know what? I got two weeks left to school. Let me come back. Bad decision. Because right. in those two weeks, in December of 95, I was barely able to function. How I got through those two weeks at school, finishing my finals and music directing uh, a show, I don't know. But I did get back that de mid-December, had the MRI, uh, and then they found this golf ball inside my brain. So how did they how did they break that to you? I was really relieved, actually, because um, I meant that wasn't crazy. Right. It was actually something truly wrong with me and that explained everything that I was going nuts trying to figure out right you know every now and then you get the doctor that says oh it's all just you know psychosomatic it's in your head really people would actually say that yeah guess what it was in my head <laughs> yes maybe you are crazy too though I am definitely yeah. crazy so how do they they'll break the news to you what do they say well, this is the 90s before cell phones when we had answering machines and cords on phones. Right. So I went for the scan in the morning, like December 21st, 2nd, 3rd, whatever. Uh, went out to lunch. Hey, kids, there were actual machines back in the day that you recorded voices on when you weren't home. And uh, they blinked when you had messages. So got back, answering machines like, Matthew, uh, we need you to come back to the hospital now. Hmm. So we're like, okay. Went back. They said, there's a mass in your brain. You need to meet with the neurologist, and he's going to see you tonight. Did they say that all in the message? No, that we got back to the okay, hospital. Okay, I was going to say that's okay. Yeah, yeah. So we met with the neurosurgeon that night, and he explained that I have a brain tumor. Hmm. And that they need to get it out of me somehow and figure out what it is. Because they really didn't do biopsies back then. They just cut your head open. But that's, that was day one. So what was going through your mind when they were Apparently telling you Apparently a golf ball-sized tumor was going through my mind. Yeah, literally. Yes. I don't know. I, 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 it's such a long time ago. I want to think and remember what I thought and felt. Yeah. I would imagine... I was just like, well, let's just get this over with. I got to graduate and live my life. Hmm. It was like like ignorance, the good kind of ignorance. Right. So the invincible ignorance. There right. we go. Yeah. Speed bump. You know, this can't possibly mess me up. This can't possibly do anything to me because I'm 21. Right. And then uh, the surgery happened and, you know, right. it was kind of train wrecked after that because that's when they figured out that it was cancer. Uh, and that if it was benign, I'd just be done. But it wasn't, so I had the rest of, you know, forever to figure out what to do with this. And uh, the surgery itself, you know, they don't do this kind of surgery anymore because that was 
little barbaric 20 years ago, but they really cut your head open. And my surgery was through the back of the neck. Wow. Not really up here where you see lots of people with scars, like straight through the spine wow. into the brain, which is risky, very risky. So, A, it's great I'm here today, but the surgery was more risky than anything else I'd done. Really? And I'm really glad they didn't tell me that in advance of the surgery. Did they know at the time how risky oh, yeah, it was? Yeah, yeah. They did. 25% survival for the surgery. Really? Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. And like the other 75% was like escaping and living with massive cognitive, you yeah. know, impairment. And I had none. Wow. So that is I don't amazing. know what I did right or wrong, but. Wow. Yeah. Do you think it has to do with how young you were and how you heal? Like do most, is there like a common age that this affects people? Well, I had a tumor called medulloblastoma, mm -hmm. which is a, it's a PNET, primary neuroendocrine tumor. Mm -hmm. It's congenital. It's, it's mm. there's a gene goes wrong in utero and your brain develops this thing and you're born with it and it lurks in, in like a, kind of like it, it's uh, hibernating. Yeah. And then for whatever reason, it wakes up one day. And typically, this tumor presents between the ages of 6 and 12. And I was 21. Hmm. So, but I mean, irrespective of that, your cognitive faculties are just that. You're still digging through your brain with a spoon. Right, you right. You want to make sure you don't mess things up. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I was developed and a young adult at the time. So it could have been, I suppose, worse if I was younger. But... You know, I could have, again, I, I, I could have died on the table, but the fact yeah. that I emerged with whatever, it was amazing. That's remarkable. Did they tell you at the time this is a 25% survival rate? Or no, no. 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 Not at no. all. Wow. No. The, I, I believe the language that I, I like to say I was given six months to live, mm -hmm. which is pseudo accurate because they kind of said, well, let's just see where we're at in six months. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I don't like the sound of that, but you know, then then everything really went to pot because I had to call grad school and tell them I'm withdrawing my application. If I was accepted, right, I couldn't play anymore. Um, I called my undergraduate and told them, by the way, I might be dead in May. Can I just graduate now? Jeez. And they said, no, you have to finish your courses. <laughs> so oh I. My God. I I stayed home and I finished my courses for the semester. You did. Um, going through all this horrible radiation and... Everything. Yeah, you said the, the, the surgery was the beginning, just the beginning. What yeah. What happened next? Well, again, I, I had radiation because there really was no brain cancer or chemotherapy back then. Mm -hmm. um, there's something called the blood-brain barrier. Sure. Where your body protects your brain by not letting bad things in. But they, they didn't crack that code for chemo until like a year after I was treated. So um, the uh, fact that I was so old with this tumor was, it threw them for a loop. Right. They didn't quite know what to do with me because there was no off-the-shelf protocol for, for me. Yeah. Which is why everything got really murky because they couldn't come up with a sort of a prognosis. They couldn't recommend. And this was like four hospitals convening to discuss my case. Wow. Coming back to me and my folks, uh, yeah, you're kind of on your own, and here's what we think you should do with this like, menu of options. So again, it just got really, got really bad. I made I made choices. My parents agreed to support whatever I chose, hmm. um, and I went through this horrible yeah. battery of, of 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 terror. It was really terrible. Yeah, and I think I don't know if it's real. It was at this time frame, but in your speech, you you talked about when you lost 110 pounds. Yeah, yeah. Um, How yeah, does so, the treatments affect you? Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is the, the the days before cancer nutrition and cancer therapy and social workers and yeah. you know we got to forgive the 90s for sucking in general. So, um, my throat swelled up shut. Wow. So I couldn't eat solid food. Oh. And I was, uh, we have anti-emetics, like anti-nausea medicines now for cancer patients. But in the late 90s, they were 
either few and far between or the one that I took wasn't nearly as effective as the ones today, mm -hmm. like Emen and Zofran. So I was still throwing up 10, 12, 14 times a day. I wow. couldn't hold it down, even if I could. So I also developed a condition called hyperthyroidism, which is when your thyroid accelerates and you're burning 10,000 calories a day Jeez. just because the body is trying to heal itself from the massive damage mm -hmm. from the radiation. And from um, February 14th to May 17th, I lost 110 pounds. Jeez. And with no guidance, with no feeding tube, with no nothing. Like they didn't think, you know. We need to get you nutrition, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I was, I was always been a little heavy. I was on steroids, which kind of blew me up to like 60 pounds more than I am now. I was like giant. And I remember them like, I don't want to think they said this on purpose. But like, well, you got some to spare. Oh, my so, God. So, like, right. Yeah. That's not the proper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bedside matter. What's, um, you know, some of the people that have talked to me about some of the really hard times, um, Talk about that, the bedside manner. How was it for you? Like um, one person was saying they were kind of treated like a number. One person had a good experience. What was your experience? My neurosurgeon was the only humanitarian in this whole process. I had many doctors. There was a pediatric oncologist, a pediatric neuro-oncologist, a radiation oncologist, a pediatric radiation oncologist, a pediatric neuro radiologist, oh. and a pediatric neuro oncologist. Every permutation of those, I had them. Right. And with the exception of the neurosurgeon, everyone else was a drone. They were very methodical and scientific and matter of fact. And fine, just cure me. I don't need you to be my friend. But at the same time, you know, this was the day before cancer was like hospitality. There was no one navigating me. There was no social support. There were no meetup groups. Yeah. There was no peers. Nothing was there. Yeah. So I kind of dealt with what I dealt with. Yeah. Um, my uh, primary oncologist, he gesticulated a lot. He was like very like, he talked like with his hands and he talked to me like this. So it was a really humorous guy, but I got to tell you, like it didn't work for me. <laughs> But he saved my life and whatever. Right. I, I managed to get through the semester. I lost all the weight. They put me on like a haagen diet because apparently ice cream was the only thing I could keep down. And mm -hmm. if I threw it up, it's just eat, eat more ice cream. Um, and uh, I, I did finish the school semester. The, the My classes kind of, they kind of conceded, you know, Matt, you, you might be dead. Let's, let's do some good for you. Um, passed my courses. I did everything possible. Graduated on time. Oh. Uh, but then the next thing happened, which is, what well, next? What well, now? You're done? Am I done? What does done mean? You know, I'm not 80. What happens now? Right. I couldn't really play any, I, I couldn't play the way I used to. I had to cancel my grad school plans. I had no future. I had no friends. Either they abandoned me or they went off to live their lives. And mm. I was envious of that. And they had guilt for doing that as my friends. Um, yeah, I, mean, I want to stick on one thing for a second because, you know, you say all these things and it's, there's a lot of emotion behind, um, like throwing up eight to 10 times a day. Like, how do you even get through one day, let alone knowing every day that's going to be the same thing? What, what was going through your mind every day to just get through that day and then through the next day? Just knew it was going to happen. There, there was predictability. I think that was the the anchor in all of this was you just knew it was going to happen, so you just knew it was going to happen. You planned for it. So there was no like just being pissed off. It was just you just kind of accepted this is the norm right now. I mean, I lived under a blanket for like six months. Yeah. It was it was terrible. Yeah. Um. That's it. You, you, it's like the expression, know, what is it, know the devil you got? This is what my life was. Mm. And I really had no choice. I actually came up with, um, I, I, 
I may have met with like a social worker once or something, and she's like, you should write this down. Write what down? So I didn't write anything down. My dad kept the journal, and we came up with this little mantra hmm. that, for what it's worth, got me through the next couple of years. Yeah. And it's, you know, like it's kind of a way to, and how do you make sense of madness? How right. do you really spiritually justify that you have to go through this to live? Yeah. And it was, uh, I can remember, everything that happens to you becomes a part of your life, and you must choose to live your life and be the best you can be every step of the way. And I remember printing it out, wallpapering my bedroom with it, yeah. just trying to live that. I don't want it to sound all dogmatic and inspirational. I just, yeah. I did it. because It's okay to do that. It's to sound inspirational. I mean, um, but it, that's what got you through. That, and I was able to play piano again, but I just wasn't good anymore. So it was, it was heartbreaking hmm. that I could, this hand was fine, this hand was, uh, so everything was kind of in here, mm -hmm. and this hand worked, but this hand just didn't do, I lost 10 years of training. Yeah. And I probably faced another five years of rehab on my own. You know, would it have been nice if they said, hey, Matt, you should get some PT? Here's a physical therapist to help you with your hand. Nothing. I can see now easily why you started stupid cancer. It took me 10 years of being really angry. Really? Uh, really angry. Very. I, I, every every six months or every year, um, the, the clinic I was treated at would send me a, how are you doing form? And... Um, I would write, and I, I think I still have them, these long-winded hate letters about how mistreated I felt and how singled out I felt and how I was a slab of meat and not a person mm -hmm. and all you cared about was statistics and there was no soul. I wasn't Matthew. Every, and, I, and I would just send these letters back every six months. Of course, they never responded to me. But there was a lot of anger because I had no direction. No. There was no help. It's it's like when the doctor says you're cured, go home. That's not the end. That's the beginning. The scariest day of my life was the last day of my treatment. Yeah. Was that like, all right, goodbye. Go live your life. You know. Um I did manage to build a secondary career. When I didn't die, I fell back to my tech geek nerd. Take yeah, because you were computer science and music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went back to my computer tech science nerd geek. You know, IBM, Macintosh, Novell, all these tech things. Mm -hmm. And um, I built a second life for myself in the advertising industry. For about 10 years, I worked in tech and creative and new media and branding and market yeah. research and it was exciting to really figure out what this would be for me, and this was the path I had to follow. This is where I was going, and I did manage to rehabilitate my hand. It took me five years, and I wrote a lot of music that was inspired by my journey. I hate that word, journey. Inspired by my experience, yeah. and um, released some CDs nice. of some piano music, and threw myself a second bar mitzvah, at 26 to celebrate five years cancer free back when five years meant something met a girl you know we eventually got married um, and my life started to really you know unfold from like yeah. 2000 to 2003 four, five. I, I mean what started to be cancer was fluke um, I didn't know that I was among tens of thousands of other people with cancer that are not 80. Right. <clears throat> and it was a real gestalt moment to meet this community. Like, where were you? Where have you been? Who are you? Yeah, so How where did you this? first meet the, or discover that? I was reached out to on like a brain tumor listserv. Kids, listservs back in the day were like chat rooms. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like group me before technology, and um, I just found this guy named Craig on a on an MIT brain tumor 
listserv that happened to exist in the late 90s. Yeah. And he was a, a brain tumor survivor. He was 10 years older than me. He was a, um, an MPH grad student at Columbia here in the city, New York. And um, we met. He's like, you, we need you. We need you to quit your job. Really? Go to charity work and never make a dollar again. <laughs> How appealing. Sign me up. And, and this guy, Craig, was single-handedly responsible wow. for bringing me into this cancer world right. where I met other young adults like him who were equally angry and equally disenfranchised and everything was cure and research and bald kids and breast cancer and prostate cancer and lung cancer and blah, blah, blah. And there was nothing that spoke to like Gen X. Yeah. So 10 years ago, pre-millennial world, Gen X, 10 years ago, nothing spoke to us. Folks in their late 20s, early 30s, and um, it was time for a bit of a revolution. What did and, he see in you, Matt? I mean, he probably talked to many, many people. Why did he point to you and say, quit your job and, and start this? I had nothing to lose. I wasn't tied to anything. I, I, had, I have no filter, first and foremost. <laughs> I'm not afraid to piss people off, and I just don't give a shit. Yeah. I really don't. I mean, it, it, what's the point of doing anything if you don't try to do everything? Mm -hmm. And that's what it took. It's like that Star Wars quote, many Bothans died to bring us these Death Star plans. I went through so much uh, to get to where we are today, to mm -hmm. pound that pavement and make a dent. But meeting other people who are young adult advocates, which is like... I never put the words young before the word adult until I met people that weren't 80 or 8 with cancer and that this was uh, in my my advertising hat was on. Here's a massive market of disenfranchised healthcare consumers that have no voice, no community, no sort of umbrella to unite our mission and no path forward to drive broader change on uh, quality of life, survivorship, improved health outcomes that were age relevant, generationally appropriate, uh, disruptive enough to get attention from industry. And I, I, I just was like, I need to start a, a, some kind of brand, some kind of something. What, what did I wish that I had? Right. And I built Stupid Cancer originally as a Yellow Pages of hundreds of resources just for well gen y gen x yeah and everyone's like well why young adults I'm like well we're we're different well how are you different well let's see uh i have sperm you know women have eggs fertility yeah you know it doesn't matter when you're eight or 80 right. Fertility matters when you're this age group, this yeah. is what makes us different among a sea of other things. It's hard enough to be 28 when you're well. Right. Let's throw cancer on top of that. You've got parenting and relationships and sexuality, intimacy, for, uh, we mentioned fertility, uh, peer support, uh, insurance, navigation, careers, uh, family medical leave act, human resources, just hair loss, you know, there's so much that, that was just unspoken. Mm -hmm. That was me. This was all me. Yeah. It was really narcissistic if you think about it. But Stupid Cancer began as just a website. And it, you now eight years later, has become the brand everyone wished they had. Yeah. What's been the toughest part about running Stupid Cancer and growing Stupid Cancer in the awareness? Everyone races for cures, and they don't get it. Everyone just races for the cure, and there is no cure. Cancer is a life sentence. You live with it. It's part of you forever. And I go back to a great quote from Lance Armstrong before his his, uh, his, yeah. his, his, his challenges. That cancer may leave your body, but it never truly leaves your life. Yeah. And there are, there are people that shut it down and want to go past there, and that's great. But there's a lot of people that can't. And 
no one's there for them. And yeah. everything that we do is beyond cure. What is your life like? What are you entitled to? You're entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We give that to people who didn't ask to get sick. Cure doesn't end when you're disease-free. And so many people live with cancer these days. It's like HIV was 10 years ago. You live with it. Mm -hmm. You just live with it. How is that cure? Where's all this research going? It's nice to have new molecules and electron microscopes and you know whatever, but research is the cancer life sentence. How do we measure how well you're doing? Yeah. What tools do millions of people need to have what they call improved outcomes? Improved, it sounds so mechanical to say it that way, but you know we want to make it suck a little less. Right. We want to make it suck a lot less. And then what do we do to ensure that it can suck a lot less? Right. That's research. That's the biggest challenge that I've had is explaining. There's no quick elevator speech to say we do cancer research. Oh, what drugs do you fund? No, no drugs. We fund people. That's the hardest challenge when you are a survivorship organization that does direct services to, pe to patients and customers. Yeah. So supporting all the auxiliary stuff that's not taken care of by the medical profession, essentially. Right. Right. I mean, I mentioned fertility. For me, that's personal. Uh, I was left infertile, barren, for my treatments. And I had to pay out of pocket to go with in vitro with my wife. I shouldn't have to buy my children because cancer took that right away from me. Yeah. But for women, it's so much harder because you can't carry a child. You may lose your ovaries. Your chemotherapy may compromise your hormones. Yeah. Now, where is the civil liberty in becoming a parent in our culture of life in this country? Yeah. Sort of the pursuit of happiness includes the pursuit of parenthood. It's not okay, ethically, morally, civilly, that a woman could be. She could be. Like, it's a doctor's decision whether she loses her right to be a mom. Because mm -hmm. she has cancer that she didn't ask to have. Yeah. So, for me, it's personal. That's research. And and that's really hard to tell the story about. Yeah. And I know in the beginning when we were talking, I wanted you to talk a little about the cancer research is changing. Yeah. I mean, again, cancer research has gotten us really far. It's gotten us drugs. We're not going to talk about the cost of care. We're not going to talk about anything else. The research today, I mean, so what I went through 20 years ago, which was a catastrophic, life-threatening procedure just to get me, you know, disease-free, right. is now like laparoscopic with chemotherapy. So that's research. Research has made it easier to not die right away. How's that? Let's say it that way. Yeah. But the, the consequence of not dying right away is where the new research matters the most. It's called navigation. Yeah. Who's going to be your Garmin through all of this process? Who's going to tell you, here's how you talk to your children when mommy is a boo-boo. Here's yeah. how you talk to your siblings when you're given end of life. That's the navigation. That's yeah. the civil liberty of research that we're trying to have that discussion about. What are some, what's the top question, most common question you get when someone first hears about your organization and what questions do you get over and over from people? We get asked, do you, can, you, can you give us money? Oh, really? Like, we need financial assistance because we're broke from cancer. Yeah. Do you offer patient scholarships? Hands down, the number one question mm. every day. And we don't. Yeah. So where do you point them, like Give Forward or one of those, one of the sites? Yeah, or, I mean, yeah. it, it, there's not enough financial assistance in the world to cover the cost of care and the impact it has, specifically on young people. I mean, if you're old and retired on Medicaid, it's very different, you know, than if you're 26, right. just getting a job and just got married and are pregnant. Yeah. So financial aid is the number one question we get. The other question we get is, where were you when I was sick? 
it's the same question that I asked right. when I started. It, where was I when I was sick? Yeah. So I need to eliminate that statement. Yeah. We need to be there when you need us. Yeah. So, man, th on that point, what works best for getting the word out for you? I go back to a Steve Jobs quote that I always like to use, which is, don't give people what they want. You give people what they didn't know they needed. Mm -hmm. And stupid cancer was what they didn't know they needed. Right. And it becomes a viral word of mouth passion campaign that's spread like wildfire. It has taken eight years, and we're now a global brand. But every person is like getting woken up in the matrix. If you didn't know it was possible to have a community just for you, you're going to want that to be different for the next you. Yeah. And this brand was in the right place at the right time with the right message to curate this cacophony into harmony for millions yeah. of people. You know, what's interesting on one of the talks you gave is when you said, I didn't have fear, but you felt isolation. Yeah. <clears throat> isolation is the number one issue facing young adults with cancer. We're only 6% of all diagnoses, but we need to know we're around. We need to know. I went seven years believing I was the only college student that ever got cancer. Yeah. And when I first met that guy, Craig, that I mentioned before, it was the greatest gift. I wasn't alone. And it's not a new concept to need peer support. We look at like AA and suicide hotlines. You need to know you're not alone, but that has never, ever happened before in young adult cancer mm -hmm. in the way that it is happening today. Yeah. So. It, it, it's got awful to hear the stories that still happen today that they how did I not know you existed I'm so pissed at my doctor for not telling me about you and the doc's like we didn't know about them so this is that the conversation we have to eliminate right what's some must know resources for people out there that stupid cancer educates people on that they wouldn't know otherwise from a, the young adult perspective, yeah. must have resources. If you have breast cancer, there's a great charity that we partner with called Young Survival Coalition. They are just for young women with breast cancer. Mm. They do a lot of similar to us, but um, you know, there is a certain value for me to have met a brain tumor young adult. That's a little different than meeting any other young adult. Right. The issues might be equally shared about isolation and fear yeah uh, but breast cancer is a whole beast unto itself yeah with reconstruction and, and, and uh, genetic predispositions and family history and beauty and stigma and hair loss so you're gonna want to meet other girls yeah who've gone through that on top of the general um, another great group that we work with is called first descents mm -hmm. they are the country's largest like adventure retreat hmm. charity they take um, 10, 20, 30 young adults at a time on hiking, surfing, kayaking, rafting, mountain climbing, um, canoeing, water rapids, on just like you're going on an outdoor adventure for a week with strangers and you come back a changed person. Yeah. That's survivorship. That's experiential. That's not cure. That's, that's research. How do we make lives better? Um, another great group if you want like if you're looking for like kind of old school peer support if you still want to pick up a phone you call Immerman Angels or you call LS First Connect or Live Strong talk to a person tell them your story they'll tell you that here's a peer um, well tell me about Instapeer talk about Instapeer for a second what yeah, was so your you know um, idea behind that and, and what should people use it for it's funny you we mentioned John Immerman from Immigrant Angels in Chicago recently. Yeah. Johnny was the inspiration for Instapeer mm. because I had asked him, was he ever thinking of doing what he does on the web? And he said, no, dude, I stay on the phone. Like, all right, fine. I love you. Stay on the phone. Uh, and I, I realized we're missing a massive audience Yeah. because teenagers don't use phones. They own them, but they don't talk on them. Right. 
they, this is my little miming for messaging as an old guy. And what's going to get the 13-year-old, the 15-year-old, the 18-year-old out of isolation? Yeah. It's going to be a version of Johnny, but on the web, uh, I mean, on, 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 in an app. Right. And this was three and a half years ago that we're like, we, why doesn't there exist an app that does like Match.com for, for teens with cancer? Right. And then we started to talk with lots of teens with cancer and their parents who are like my age. And they wanted it to be anonymous to avoid bullying and stigma. Okay, wow. And they didn't want pictures and photos. They just wanted to be able to know that they could message somebody privately hmm. that is like, we say like N of one of their exact where they live, what they have, what stage they're at, what their fears are, hmm. what their side effects are. Um, are they... LGBT queer, are they uh, end of life, are they bald, like anything that their demographic dictates, right. they want to mat match somebody just like them around the world. So we developed Instapeer over the last three years to serve basically teens, filling this gap that they're not picking up a phone and calling yeah. a stranger to be told talk to the stranger. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the origin. And it, it launched uh, a year ago in a private beta with about 300 people testing it for us and it launched in a public beta uh, at uh, our annual conference last April called CancerCon and now there's about 2,000 people incubating it for us around the world yeah. and we're going to hopefully pivot to a new version of it by 2016. Yeah. But it's it's ending isolation. Yeah. I mean, what's the challenges? Because now it's like a, a whole another animal like a software company. I mean, uh, yeah, running an app. What's what's the challenges with that? Hey, I'm an app developer. That's my LinkedIn profile. Right. <laughs> I don't know how I get myself in these things. Instapeer is becoming an animal unto itself. As right. You know. Right. It, it 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 needs to become its own company at some point. Um, but for now, I it's built such excitement and trust and um, reputability in the user base in our industry that this is something coming from patients yeah. and not coming from industry. Yeah. Industry has a tendency to build great things and never talk to people and it doesn't yeah. work and all that VC money is just poof, gone, bye. Whereas charities in a rut where we can't raise the millions that, in, that VCs can do, but we can build the tech that makes a difference. So it's this fascinating anthropologic business conundrum. How do we monetize Instapeer, yeah. sustain the charitable efforts and the value it serves the community without compromising integrity and giving it off to investors to change its purpose? Um, that's that's that, the best question of the day. So what what is it? I need really do? rich people to write big checks. Really? Yeah. Like uh, it wouldn't be... What have you explored that you think is feasible? Not paying per user or something like that or... No, yeah. um, it, it has to be free. It can never be paid. Mm -hmm. It has to be available to anyone that wants it around the world. Yeah, any age, any disease, yeah. any side effect. It's tough. Any language, any country. Um, it has to be evidence based, like everything else we do. We have to know that it's just not nice to have, but does it truly improve health outcomes academically? Mm. Yeah, and that's cancer research. Yeah, you know. So there's so much we could talk about Instapeer, you know, just from your the approach that you take with asking the person, because I thought it was interesting when I saw it, it's anonymous. Like when you yeah. go on there, I wouldn't have expected that, but I figured I saw that and they must have done something, some research behind why. And if we had more time, you know, I'd have you talk about some of the the interesting discoveries that people demanded that you wouldn't have known otherwise. I know we're right at the top of the time right now. Yeah. I mean, so, uh, the, it, it's not 100% anonymous. It's like, like pseudonymous. No, but that's not the point. The point is you asked them and they told you that's what they wanted. Right. You know. Well, they wanted it because typically, you know, if you go to online, some of the cancer forums that are out there, yeah. it really becomes a pissing contest over who suffered more. Mm. And we don't want to be that Right. We're not pitting anyone against each other. The playing right. field is level when you're anonymous. Right. And you have the right to determine who you want to talk to. And if you don't want to talk to them, don't talk to them. Yeah. 
So we're eliminating any mitigating factors that would be uh, put offish. Yeah, that's a word. You know. Yeah. So Matt, this has been extremely valuable. I, I highly appreciate your time, despite your crazy travel schedule, running Instapeer, stupid cancer, having s some sick kids in the house right now. Yeah. So thank you so much for that. Um, I want to know where we can point people towards. What sites should we send them to? Maybe just a list a few of the ones that um, you know, obviously that you run, and then maybe we'll just leave them some some parting words. Well, I'll say this: We're building our board. We need really smart, rich people who have business experience, yeah. not just startup people. Um, we're different. We're a very different charity. I don't run it like a charity. I run it like a business. Yeah. I run it like an agency. I think agency. We're client based. We're not donor dependent. Yeah. And uh, we're the best group you never heard of to be a part of. So that, that's my appeal to your audience. Join us at the leadership level. Yeah. Talk to you. And uh, stupidcancer.org, instapeer.org, on iPhone, iPad, iOS, Android, um, and uh, iOS 9 compatible, and Marshmallow compatible soon. <laughs> Add a little tech nerd in there. Um, but we become a big deal, and we need, we need yeah. smart people to help us and steward us. Yeah. So last words of people, um, for people. Um, you know, what's amazing to me is not just that you've done all you've done, and the brain cancer, but like, I really encourage people to check out the YouTube video where you gave that talk, because you listed all, that was just the beginning. You were talking about arrhythmias and loss of hearing and other things that occurred throughout the years. So just end with some of the, the things you go to when times are tough. I'm playing piano again. Really? It took me a long time, and now I'm giving concerts for audiences and patients, survivors. I just came back from Atlanta, and I delivered a mm. concert to 700 nurse navigators. Wow. And I told my story, and I talked to here, and that's where I go. So and my going daughter, to what you love. Yeah, and my, my daughter um, just started piano lessons. She's five. Mm. So that's where I'm going now. Yeah. Not now, but now. Yeah, I know what you mean. And Autumn Drive was one of those after. Yep, Autumn Drive. That's my uh, my go-to piece. Yeah, love it. Matt, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.